hi, I'm Molly, and I had a brain tumor. Um, I want to start with probably my childhood, actually, because I had a relatively normal childhood. I played every sport under the sun. I had no problem, like, picking up anything either. I played competitive volleyball. I played competitive tennis. I played competitive basketball. I did everything. I was very active. This is more important towards the end of the story, but I just was really fortunate to grow up the way that I did. And throughout like life, I just started to get like migraines and things like that. And my parents just chalked it up to nothing. Like she's just going through puberty. She's getting older it's it's normal were they like bad to the point that you would have to like stay in bed with oh, the yeah. lights out okay Sweet. so they're pretty intense well, yeah cool cloth over your eyes really all the okay. lights out yeah it, yeah and that was it really started like the worst in high school is mm-hmm. when I started to see it and I could sleep for like 36 hours it, really oh yeah I was exhausted all the time did you ever go to the doctor about it during this time or no just no like okay yeah I think it was just more or less my mom she was a critical care nurse, so she actually retired after I had my surgery. But she – basically, it came down to, like, barfing, bleeding, or broken was kind of what I grew up with with, mm-hmm. with going to school. Like, if you want to call home, you want to say uh, you were either barfing, bleeding, or broken, mm-hmm. basically. So right. she took everything as, like, you're, it's not that bad. You're green as well. Yeah. You're dehydrated. You need to eat something, like – take some sleep time and you'll be fine. Yeah. And I feel like migraines are so common too. Like yes. I feel like I always hear, I've, I've always been like the stomach ache girl. So like mm-hmm. that's always what I get. Same. But yeah. like a lot of my friends, like they get migraines mm-hmm. and I like can't really, cause I really, I don't think maybe I've had one once, yeah. but like, I feel like it's so common for people to be like, oh, I just have a really bad migraine yes. today or something. Yeah. I got to a point where mine started to get debilitating where then yeah. I got concerned, but right. it was nothing that like drove me to go to the hospital. Yeah. Um. So I went through high school, again, played varsity tennis all four years. I was just so active. I loved going to the gym. And then I got to college and had a a lot of fun, a lot of fun in college. And I actually ended up transferring home my for my sophomore, junior, and senior year. And luckily, that's kind of around the time that I started having episodes. So in May of 2017, I was kind of Oh, actually, let's go to February. February 2017. This will be like the first indicator. Um, I was on the ground with a dog and I was kind of rolling back and forth. And as soon as I like twinged my neck the wrong way, I got the spins. Like when you've had way too much to drink Mm -hmm. and you need to put a foot on the ground, I immediately got sick. And then I ended up um, just going home after that. You started throwing up? Yeah. Just from like twisting your neck? Yes. Wicked spins. Yeah. And so I went home and I fell asleep and I woke up the next morning, felt totally fine. So I went to school. I handled all my stuff. It was right around the weekend of my 21st birthday. So then I ended up going to Vegas with my family, had a great time. So I just completely forgot about it. And then come May of 2017, it happened again. I got thrown onto a bed. And as soon as my head hit the mattress, it was instant spins. My equilibrium was off. I had to crawl on the floor. I was so uncomfortable. And at the time, my boyfriend, he drove me home, had to leave my car. That lasted for three days. Like I just the feeling sick. And, yeah. Okay. Throwing up, couldn't get my equilibrium right. If I think my mattress was on the floor at the time. And if it wasn't, I was sleeping on the floor because mm-hmm. I was so scared that I was going to roll out because I just yeah. couldn't get my balance and couldn't drink anything, couldn't eat anything. And my parents just, again, chalked it up to you don't eat enough. You need more fluids. There's just – it's just kind of normal bodily functions. And come the third day of that, I – knew something was wrong. And my dad was actually getting ready to go on a work trip. So I went into his room first and I was just like, hey, something's wrong. I don't know what to do. And he was driving to Wyoming that morning. He was like, I got to go. I can't do this. Call your mom. My mom happened to be working at the hospital that day. So I called her and she said, just go wake up your sister, have her take you to the hospital and I'll meet you here. And so I woke up my sister. She had an interview that day. So she happened to be at the house with us and she dropped me off at the hospital. So at this point, I'm in the ER alone. And the I feel like the hospital, the healthcare system is kind of like a revolving door. They want you in, they want you out. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a put a bandaid on it and get you on your way. Right, because at this point you weren't like seeing a specialist. It was just no. like a normal. Yeah, and I right. didn't even know I had the tumor at the time. Yeah. Like this is about the time where I found out. Um, 
So I went to the ER and they told me, oh, you probably have a crystal knocked off on your ear. So I guess you have three crystals and they kind of control your equilibrium. And they did neural checks, they did blood work, and all of that came out just inconclusive. They were like, there's nothing wrong. Did they do a scan? No. No, okay. So this is where I came in and I said, you need to do a CT scan. Mm-hmm. I'm here. I've paid my right. copay. I'm, I, I need You've everything handled. everything else. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted everything taken care of. Isn't it crazy that it's like you almost have to have your own back with so many things like that yes. in the world? It's like you have to be the one that's like You have to advocate for up. yourself. Yeah, mm-hmm. and get, get it done because yeah. if not, people just won't really do it. Oh, and they would have totally sent me home. Right. Yeah. So I got the CT scan and usually to get that pathology report, the radiology report, it takes some time. So when somebody came into my room about like 15, 30 minutes later, I was a little confused and it was a nurse and she, the first thing she said to me was, do you want somebody in the room with you? And I was like, what? no, are you going to tell me I have a concussion? And then she sat down and I was like, oh, okay. And she goes, you have a small mass in your brain. And I looked at her, didn't know what the hell mass meant. I was mm-hmm. like, what do you mean mass? And she said, well, you have a small brain tumor. And I just was like, stop, I'm going to call my mom. She's upstairs. She worked in the ICU at the time, so the intensive care unit. And she was so fortunate to have the most amazing pod mates that they let her come down to me. And I want to say within two seconds, like a neurosurgeon was following her, basically. And it it worked out because I happened to be at the hospital my mom worked at. So everybody knew her. Mm -hmm. I got care rather quickly just because now it's, it's much more serious. She's very involved. And the neurosurgeon came in and he sat down and he said... Do you know? Do you know what's going on? And I told him. Well, the nurse told me I have a small mass in my brain. And he then actually sat down on my bed, and he looked at my mom and I in the eyes, and he goes, "No, no, 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 no. You have a large mass, a massive mass in your brain. This tumor is huge." And her and I both kind of looked at each other. And I want to say, around the ER time is the only time I actually cried, which is a little weird until after recovery. And it was kind of just a rolling ball effect after this. Yeah. Um, I had to get admitted. So they started doing more blood work. They started doing MRIs. They needed brain mapping. It was like one thing after the other. So at this point, did they not know if it was like benign or? They had no idea. They just knew it was like a large mass. Matter. Right. Okay. Yeah. And because so it where it was, was in the dead center of my brain on what's called the, uh, it was a pineal gland t- tumor, um, which was pressing on my tectum, which actually controls actually controls your equilibrium in your brain. So that's why I was getting the episodes. Right. But we didn't know anything until actually after I had surgery. Mm-hmm. So it was right, all kind of just- because then they would have to go in there to actually see what was going on. Yeah. And in, in the dead center of your brain, you mm-hmm. can't like get a biopsy or anything. Right. So we- we got, I got admitted and I just kind of went with the punches from this point. And having a critical care nurse as a mom was kind of a blessing and a curse because she immediately started doing research and she knew a lot of things in regards to people having neurosurgery and the repercussions and the effects that it has on people who have to go through it and their families. And I think that was not the best because she fell down a rabbit hole and it really took a toll on her because she just I mean obviously you go to my kid's gonna die Mm -hmm. and they didn't know what was happening and with when you don't have answers you just have to go to the worst and just prepare for it um so at that point my mom ended up calling my family members my sister got like got me a my little care bag my blankets and stuff to be able to shower and have to stay in the hospital for my extended period of time so they weren't gonna let you go home after they found this no okay Mm -mm. so i had to get a bunch of different tests and one of them the one that i remember the most was actually called a lumbar puncture they take this like massive needle and they put it in one of your discs in your lumbar spine to pull out cerebral spinal fluid And they more or less just wanted to discount having basically cancer that had spread to my spine. So this was just making sure that my cerebral spinal fluid was okay, which it was, thank Mm -hmm. God. Um, But then after that, I had to lay on my back for eight hours, which was miserable. I couldn't move just to regenerate your cerebral spinal fluid. And then they came in. So two neurosurgeons that were on the team at the hospital I was at came in and just kind of gave me a breakdown of what they were thinking. And what they were thinking was nothing. They said, we don't know. We don't know what it is. We don't know how it, how it came to be. We don't know how we would get there. We just, we just know it needs to come out so we can go in there and we can figure it out as we go. Um, we 
can obviously refer you to other neurosurgeons and having a neurosurgeon tell you we don't know we can figure out how to get in there and do something about it was terrifying right because then it's like when you make that choice to get the surgery and go under you don't know if you're coming back out right you're like and well that's my brain too i want somebody who actually has some form of an idea as to what's going on uh so they actually then to it was just perfect timing and they had a huge neurosurgeon meeting on the Saturday. So I think this was a Friday that I was finding everything out. And then on a Saturday, they had this conference nationwide with a bunch of different neurosurgeons. And they said, we want to present your case if that's okay with you, because we want to help you find answers. We want to find answers. And if we can get people from all over, all these different neurosurgeons to give us some opinions, we would love to do that. And I was like, absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing that they yeah. wanted to do that too. I got super lucky with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, they did discharge me. They put me on so many meds. I mean, I had been on meds since I had started this whole ER experience. I mean, everything under the sun, typical cocktail. The worst one was they gave me a steroid, which was to calm the swelling in my brain. And it made me blow up like a balloon. I was going to say, yeah. I was so fat. In the f- it wasn't like I got fat everywhere else. It was like right. my face was huge. Yeah. And um, I think that started to weigh on me. I was like, my appearance is changing. Like, I just want to live as normal as I can until I have surgery because I really didn't know if I were going to make it. So I wanted to make the best of literally everything I could. I kid you not, I have so many photos that my mom was like, there are monkeys somewhere outside of like a shopping mall that's near my house. And she was like, go jump on one and I want to take a picture of you. I literally did everything they wanted to do Mm -hmm. because I wanted them to have the happy memory of me. Even if I came out and I were like a vegetable, I still wanted them to remember like, this is my daughter. Look at how happy she was. She was so fun, so outgoing. And that was really important for me for them. And I think through this whole process, that's actually what I ended up doing was I saw everybody around me crumbling And so I had to be the strong one. And I think that's kind of where I just didn't cry because I didn't want anybody to think that I was scared. Um, And like it was like your responsibility almost to keep them together. Yeah. Because if they saw you together. Exactly. Right. And then they kind of felt like I was going to be okay. Yeah. And And how old were you? 21. Okay. That's Mm -hmm. what I thought. Yeah. Right. I literally found out right after my 21st birthday, which kind of sucks. But I got to experience the 21st birthday, which was nice. Um, so when I got home from the hospital, my mom immediately started reaching out to every neurosurge in the United States that she could. I mean, she spoke to people at UCLA, at NYU. She was talking to people in Scottsdale, Arizona, like trying to touch all the main bases to just see where, where's the best place to take my daughter. And we actually got really lucky. I found my neurosurgeon in Colorado. So I was able to go through surgery and recover at home. But he was incredible. I met him. He gave me the most minimal information. And I think that was to keep my mind at ease. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't overthinking the whole process. I wasn't scared. I wasn't going to be worried about X, Y, Z, what I was going to come out like, how long the surgery was. It was more or less just here's what's going to happen. I think I know what your tumor is. And this is how I want to go about it. So he immediately, like out of nowhere, just gave me everything the first neurosurgeons didn't, which was the most comforting thing. And knowing that my recovery was going to be quite a bit of time extensive, I chose to be at home because I didn't want to recover in a random state. I feel like that would have just made it so much harder. Yeah. So from there, we had to set a date. He said it needs to be, it's urgent. It needs to be as soon as possible. They pushed it out for the end of May. And then from then on out, it was kind of a waiting game. I had to move. Um, I lived at the um, the upstairs of my parents' house. So I had to move to the first floor master where because I was a fall risk. I couldn't walk up and down stairs. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere unassisted. I couldn't drive my car anymore. I was and this is before I even had surgery. This was just like you're done. Your right. life is done. My sister, when I was in the ER, actually emailed all of my teachers because I was still in school at the time and just said, you know, my sister's not coming back. She has a brain tumor. Don't know what to do. And I got really lucky. All of my teachers just passed my finals. They were like, here you go. Here yeah. are your grades for the year. Figure it out. We hope you're okay, which was awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't, I didn't have to go back and take those exams again, yeah. which I was really appreciative mm-hmm. of. Um, but 
kind of just leading up, we were just preparing, like getting all the food ready. I started a blog with my mom to kind of keep our family and friends in the loop. I grew up really privileged. So, I, I mean, we didn't need people bringing us meals or anything. I didn't need a GoFundMe, which was really nice to, you know, support myself. And I just have amazing parents who basically gave me the world and they still had me on their insurance, which was great. So I was covered. And I didn't want anybody to see me. So I was kind of just in my blog post, like, we appreciate your thoughts and prayers. Please don't come to the house. Like I didn't, I wanted everybody to remember me if I were to die, if I were a vegetable after this. I wanted everybody to remember me as this happy-go-lucky, very outgoing, so determined, very athletic girl that just beaming smile all the time. That's what I wanted. So I kind of was just, it was just me and my family and we were getting to spend a lot of time together, which was nice. And I think also too, like that was a lot for you to take in Mm -hmm. and handle. And I think- that if you were just having people constantly come, it's overwhelming. You know, Very. I feel like that, sh- that it makes sense that, you know, regardless of people seeing you physically, it's like that was kind of your time to just sit on it and be Process. alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And not really have the constant people like right coming in and out. Yeah. It was, it's actually weird. I never fully processed it. I never did therapy. I never did anything. And I think that has kind of started to come up after surgery. I start mm-hmm. to have some PTSD. I definitely have things come up that are, like just trauma that I need to yeah. handle. And it's something that I almost would rather just not because it was such a traumatic time in my life that I'd rather just keep moving forward. I know it's no, inevitable. It like like, like yeah. I'll have to handle it eventually. Right. But I, I'm the same way. It's like things like that. It's I think right after it happens, it's kind of you think it's done with and mm-hmm. you can just move forward. But then like you said, it starts kind of coming up in other ways because it's yeah. hard. I think it's it's really difficult for humans to process such traumatic things, Mm -hmm. you know, and we just think that because it's over with, it's over with. Right. You know, our brain doesn't really work that way. No, especially mine. Like I had so many things that were going on with it. Um, But so from there, I just was hanging out with my family. We were doing as much as we could. Obviously, I was very limited. I kind of felt like a child. I had to be kind of attended by somebody the entire time. And then we went in for surgery on May 31st. And originally what my doctor had told me was maybe six hours. It's it's going to be just quick in and out. We're going to go up through the back of your head. This is how we want to do it. And then you'll just – you'll be in recovery. And I had so many questions right. prior to this surgery. Like, will I be able to go back to school? What is recovery going to be like? What are my odds? Is my tumor uh, – what is the word where you can give it to kids hereditary mm-hmm. is I just didn't know anything so did you ask any of these questions or in this moment you were like I don't um know. in this moment I actually my mom asked a lot of these questions okay. I remember the biggest thing for me was is it hereditary because there's nothing I want more in this world than to be a mom and I mean ever since I was little it was what do you want to be when you grow up and I would always say a mom so that was going to be like my heartbreaker that's probably when I would have crumbled if they told me yeah you can't I wouldn't have kids if if I were you, but they were, they were very hopeful that it wasn't, mm-hmm. it was totally, um, that it wasn't going to hurt me, that it was not hereditary or yeah, not hereditary. Um, but we ended up going into surgery that morning. I had to have like these nasty soap showers for the three days going up into it that were like no conditioner, nothing. I wasn't allowed to use body wash. It was absolutely miserable. Um, I felt just so gross. Yeah. And then when we got into surgery, my whole family was able to come back into pre-op with me, which was really nice. So this is where they kind of prepped me for everything. And I will never forget this. We were all hanging out in there. I'm trying to laugh and giggle, just like nothing's going to go wrong. We're all going to be fine. And we, one of the doctors came in. I remember him because he was a hot doc. He was like the hottest this doctor the in the entire life. Exactly. <laughs> He's the one who started getting me out of bed. I was like, absolutely. I'm going to go sit get down out in of the bed chair. For you. Yeah. Exactly. And he came in and he like had buzzers in his hand and he was like, just clicked him by my ear. And he goes, I'm just going to start kind of doing something. And I was like, okay. He started shaving little bits and pieces out of my hair and these pieces were falling onto my gown. And I started like picking them up and looking at them. And my mom was like, no, 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 honey, I'll do this. And I'm like kind of giggling. I'm like, I just am going to be a spotted dog, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to have spots everywhere. And then he started like gluing little blue things to my head to do brain mapping. I found out later it was for brain mapping so they could get like a 4D or 3D image of my brain to be able to fully see like where my ventricles were, where all of my veins were, where what was being fully impacted, where my brainstem was. That was the most important part. So you, I don't know if you're going to know this or if you ended up 
asking. But my curiosity is if it was in the middle of your brain, mm-hmm. how the fuck did they go? Like, how did they get in there? Uh, so they cut up through the back of my head. And because where my tumor was sitting, it was squishing my cerebellum, which Uh is that lower part of your brain, and it actually controls your muscular function. So when the doctors were looking at my scans and then hearing about my story and how I grew up playing all of these competitive sports, how I was a varsity athlete in high school, how I literally went to the gym every day, lifting weights, doing everything, they were like, I don't know how. Right. Like, how the fuck is this girl okay? Yeah. Nobody knew. Like, how did you make it that far? Did they yes. did they have any idea of how long it was yeah. probably in there growing? I was born with it. Really? Mm-hmm. So it just kind of was growing yeah. your whole life. Yes. Yeah. It was wow. um baby cells. What are the baby cells called? I don't even remember. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't either. I I do wow. know it, but I can't remember it at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so they were able to know that that it was okay. This was so from the pathology, so after I had surgery. Okay, sorry. I'm yeah. fast forwarding. Okay, You're go fine. back. Go, You're fine. Go back so to where you were. So pre-op, so he was shaving my head. We were all giggling and my my mom and dad and sister were all in there with me and we all kind of just tried to remember it as the happiest time ever. And my parents were able to get like this sheet from the doctor that had phone numbers on it. And so the neuro team that was in with me, I don't even know how many, there were like at least 15 people in my surgery. It was crazy. And they were texting my parents throughout my surgery and they were able to communicate. And they said, you know, we'll come out ever so often and give you updates, which after I found out that they only came out like twice and my parents were really freaking out. Um, My surgery So, well, I guess we can go into the brain mapping. This is where I completely blacked out. Um, I don't fully remember the brain mapping. I think they drugged me enough to like where I could sleep through that because it was an extensive MRI. Mm -hmm. And then I remember they took me to pre-op and or into like the operating room, but they were still prepping me. It was freezing. It's a stark white. And they started sticking things onto like my bony prominences. So like my knees, my hips, I think my elbows and my chest um, because I was face down prone for the entire surgery. Like knees bent, arms back, face in like a basically yeah. a massage chair situation. Um, and my surgery actually ended up lasting 10 hours. Wow. I don't remember them putting me face down or anything. I just remember getting the stickies on my knees. That was the most important one. And then I was asleep. And we were all thinking six-hour surgery, in and out, no problem. It ended up being 10 hours. And my family, they got updates through like the first four or six hours. And then it was like nothing for the last Right, which is the scariest part. Yes. Because then it's like going over at that point. Right. And so they started to worry. There were like all of these colors on screens, I guess. And while they're getting text messages of like different patients in surgery and I guess like, I don't know if it was purple or something, but a color indicated, okay, she's out of surgery. She's in post-op just so you know, but everything went okay. Never happened. Really? Yeah. So after my surgery, after that like 10 hour mark, the doctors came out and did speak to my family and said, you know, everything went well. We sent her her everything that she had, all of the stuff in her brain. So my tumor, like I said, was in the middle. And then it was actually surrounded by three cysts. So, I mean, it, my tumor was about the size of a small plum. And then the cysts around it created even more space mm-hmm. in the middle of my brain. So my brainstem was pushed forward. My hypothalamus was pushed out of the way. My cerebellum, like I said, was squished. Like every part of my brain was impacted. Right. And so they... They told my parents basically it was really complex surgery. It was really close to her brainstem. We pulled as much as we could. We think we got all of it. We think it is a full resection. We're going to have to do like a six months post op MRI to just clear her. And so. So if it wasn't, if you didn't, if they like did that post op and then in the scan with the scan and mm-hmm. saw that there was still more in there, would they have had to go back in? Radiation. Okay. I don't think I would have let them go back don't in. Okay. There. Yeah. But maybe I would have. I don't know if it did rapidly grow. Um, With the tumor I had, it did have a 64% regrowth rate within the first five years. So this past May, actually, I hit five years. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm really excited. I got down to now it's a 0.09% chance of regrowth, which is like none, which is wonderful. Um, But so from there, I was in post-op. I want to say my mom wasn't allowed to come see me for like 45 minutes. And still to this point, I don't remember any of this. My mom kept the most detailed notebook 
And we actually called the Brain Bible now, and I have it. I take it with me pretty much everywhere I go if I'm traveling, just so people know like my history. That's and smart. Yeah. it's so detailed. And she was talking about how like I was crying my eyes out and I was begging for my mommy. And all I kept saying was how much pain I was in. And the doctors then later told her, well, we were we had needles stuck in all of her mus- muscles during her surgery to test her reflex and her muscular function to make sure that we don't nick anything, to make sure that we weren't hurting anything. So she's going to feel like she just worked out really hard and she's going to feel that way for a little while. That is so incredible how they do these surgeries Everything. and just like can, they think about things that like, you know, we would never think. Of. Right. That's crazy. Crazy. Um, I also was really lucky I didn't have to be awake because some people during brain surgery I've, I've have to stay awake. I've seen that Anatomy. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do that. I don't know if I would have been no. able to do that. That's yeah. what people, because I got, um, side note, but I got LASIK mm-hmm. and it, like you're awake for it. And that's like a couple of my friends are like, well, how were you awake? And yeah. I, I always, I, it didn't hurt, but it was one of the scariest things I've ever done. Absolutely. But yeah, I cannot imagine because it's one of those things that if you're laying there, mm-hmm. you're like, I can't move. And then when I feel like in your head, once you think like, I can't move. You start like moving. Oh yeah, you, you know start moving. I, mean? I feel yeah, like flipping the, the fuck out. noise would weird me out. Right. I feel like I would probably have a full blown panic attack. One hundred percent. Yeah, I I don't think I got I got really lucky yeah. with that. Um. So with my surgery though, they ended up taking my cere or not my cerebellum, my occipital bone, which is the bone that's at the base of your your skull, and they were able to remove some of that, and then basically just like wiggle their way through all of the hemispheres of my mm-hmm. brain to get to, right the, middle. to the middle. Yeah. And it was, they thought maybe it would come out just all at once, but it was like piece by piece by piece. And I guess it was really dense. So they obviously sent out like the first little chunk to pathology to just figure out, okay, is it cancer? Is it benign? Is it, what is it? They just mm-hmm. needed to know. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, from there, they were able to actually kind of chunk it all out and then that last piece with all of the cysts kind of came out all together and they said that was like the most satisfying part because mm-hmm. it was like you're done that was right. it and then I had to get I have a plate and screws in the back of my head where my occipital bone is just to re- reinforce the bone and then I had internal sutures external sutures and staples all down the back of my head like 19 I want to say wow. it was did they lot. have to shave your whole head no Okay, I got so just so lucky. the back, just the back, just okay. up the back, which was really nice. Even though I had all these little spots anyway, it was right. like I was kind of okay if they were yeah. going to do that. I just saved my life; mm-hmm. was awesome. Right. Um, but I was, I got really fortunate. So I was in post op. I want to say for a couple hours, and then they took me to the intensive care unit, which I, I mean, I had to be there. I needed neuro checks. I couldn't get up. I had this stupid little urine bag I hated that thing I got a UTI so bad and I remember I had to tell the hot doc I had to tell the hot doc (laughs) something's wrong down there I was like I his name was a call and I was like a call I think I have a UTI or yeast infection I need help and he was like okay I'll take care of that I'll send out a script right now but I was beat red I was so embarrassed I did not want to tell the hot doctor that yeah it was awful that is funny (laughs) but um so when I came out I had this massive like turban around Mm -hmm. my head which is just really really tight gauze basically wrapped around my head and I remember it was like so uncomfortable and I couldn't talk I was face down for so long with all this pressure on my neck I could not talk I could not swallow it was really actually kind of terrifying that part, yeah. the not swallowing. But he came in and he kind of, my neuro did, and he kind of explained to me, you know, this is what the process is going to be. They weren't sure if I would ever be able to go back to school. They said there's a high likelihood you won't be able to resume like a normal life. You're going to have to treat yourself like a 60-year-old woman. You probably won't have to, won't be able to work extensively. You'll need to work a more minimal job. Stress is going to be really, really hard on your body. You're going to need lots of rest. It was like, <clears throat> boom, 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 boom. This can't, like, my life will never be normal again. Right. And so he, once he went over all of that and cut my turban, which was wonderful, that was so painful. Um, that was kind of just the start of the recovery for me was I need to prove everybody wrong, basically. Yeah. I want to go back to school. I want to do all these things. And Did they say how long that they thought it might be? Um, a year at least. Wow years though and I mean, then you would also have to be doing um like rehab and stuff like that. physical therapy yeah. a lot of it so I actually needed a 
physical therapist for my mouth because I could not talk very well. Right. Um, and then my swallowing. I couldn't swallow. So was that all from the surgery? Yes. Or? Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like there was anything preventing it. It was no. literally just from the brain surgery. Okay. Yes. And so I, how would you eat and drink? I aspirated so many times like just inhaled food mm-hmm. inhaled liquid I had to chew up my pills and my sister she says it's like the most traumatic thing and if she ever hears a suction cup again it'll drive her crazy mm-hmm. but I had this like suction tube that was constantly on next to me because when I was throwing up a ton I the meds kicked my ass yeah. and usually they like give you a Zofran or something for that but none of it was working I was just sicker than a dog And so, I mean, I would throw up and then I would like suction out my mouth. And then if I had saliva, I would have to suction out my mouth because I couldn't swallow it. And I was scared to swallow because when you have just had brain surgery, you still have a ton of pressure in there. It's there's so much trauma that just happened. And the pain that was in my specifically my lower neck from those staples, like coughing, Right. You think coughing really isn't like a big deal. Mm-hmm. Oh, I never want to cough again in my life. I was miserable. Yeah. And, and even the throwing up, I mean, like, oh gosh. That's the, after any surgery, throwing up, mm-hmm. that it's horrible. Like it's horrible. The wor- yes. one of the worst things that yeah. can happen. I had my tonsils taken out, side note, and I threw up all of after that too. Like scabs came out, everything. Yeah. I was like, oh, wonderful. I'm never. Uh, yeah. Like- I'm not, I don't do well with surgeries yeah, either. either. Like even like the more like minimal ones, it's just, I've never done well with it. I don't really do great with like, pain meds. I usually get sick too, Mm -hmm. but it sucks. Yeah. Um, So I was basically dependent on this little suction tube. Mm -hmm. It was my best friend. I had to drink liquid Tylenol and I aspirated on that first. And that's where I was like, okay, I'm just going to start chewing up pills. I can't try any of this. They had to start giving me thickened water, which is obviously like a cup of water, but like pre jello stage. So it's a little bit thicker, so it was easier to go down because this is so thin that it was just going straight to my lungs. Um, And I think it was just from being so face down for so long, just that trauma. But also, I mean, I don't know if it had anything to do with my tumor. Again, everything was impacted. Mm -hmm. So that muscular response with my tongue and my throat totally could have been impacted. Um, And then walking. I did not want to walk. I did not want to get up. I was not motivated to move. Shout out to Hot Doc because he was the one who got me out of bed. Mm -hmm. Um, I know I got to a point where I was complaining about the UTI and he said, well, if you get up and get out of bed, I'll take out your catheter. If that's what you want, go ahead. And eventually I kind of was just like, fine, fuck it. I will get up out of this bed. I was so miserable. I was in so much pain. I didn't want to do anything. At this point, I was kind of like, Sometimes I wish the tumor would have just taken me because this is miserable. I was miserable. And I... And you were still in the hospital at this point? Yeah, I'm still in the ICU. I was in the ICU, I want to say for, I don't know, three days. It took me a while because I I was so hell-bent on not getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. And so they were like constantly checking my neuromuscular function. I was getting all these neuro exams. They were looking at my eyes, watching my reflex in my feet. So when you were in bed, were you still like moving your arms? And mm-hmm. like, okay, I so had you full motion. Get, okay. I, and I just didn't want to get up. Um, That's, it's scary too because it's like I feel like – if you take that step and something goes wrong, I feel like mentally you'd flip out. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? So oh, it's yeah. like I was terrified to yeah. fall. I knew I knew everything that could go wrong. And so I didn't want any part of it. I was like, right. I'm I'm good. I'm healing. We're yeah. fine. Leave me in bed. Exactly. Bed Don't yeah. touch me. I'm fine. Um, but no, so they actually ended up getting a uh a physical therapist, and the physical therapist came in. And she was great. She actually had worked with my mom at one point. So they knew each other really well, which was phenomenal. I had the shittiest nurse in the entire world. So I'm happy that I actually got a really nice physical therapist. Mm -hmm. And they had to gait assist me. So I had to wear a gait belt, which basically means they had to hold me up. Yeah. And I'm a tall person. I'm 5'10". So my mom's 5'6". And this little little PT was probably about 5'6". And so it was funny, like, having them try and hold me up by my waist Mm -hmm. when I'm so much taller. So I was actually scared about that, too, balance. I had a walker in front of me. I was on oxygen, so it had to be taken with me everywhere. I had, obviously, all of my IVs. And I remember, like, pushing myself to the edge of the bed with my feet over it. And I was just in an upright position. I was so dizzy. I, like, you could see me Mm -hmm. physically spinning. I thought I was going to fall out of this bed. And they said, you know, just when you're ready, 
I sat there for a very long time to a point where this PT was like, okay, it's time. Mm -hmm. Like, stand up. And so they got me to stand up. I was holding onto this chair and I tried to start picking up my legs just to like make sure I could do it because I had a little bit of fear like right. that my my whole functionality was gone and so I was picking up my legs I felt totally fine I think I went to the bathroom I don't fully remember that part but then I just went and got back in bed and um that was wonderful I mean I think pushing pushing me to get out of bed was great it was like because, the first baby step yes mm-hmm. that baby step was kind of like the domino effect because then I just started really pushing myself And from there, they needed me to start walking or else I couldn't get transferred up to like a a less intensive care spot. So I needed to go to the neurofleur. And so they had me start walking up and down the hallways with my walker. And I had a lot of left gait issues. So my left leg, I didn't fully pick it up the right way. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had it more turned to the center of my body. So it was kind of like my normal right leg walking, but then I kind of had this like little shuffly white like duck leg Mm -hmm. on the left side that was falling behind me, which was just, I mean, it was kind of funny, like hindsight, but um, but scary. Like, scary. Yeah. My mom immediately said to the uh, the PT, and I actually heard her behind me, like, "Oh, there's some like left gate. There's a left gate issue." And I went to so school. Does for, that mean it's the, it would be the whole left side of your body, or was it just just your my? Leg? So gate is just walking. Got so it. just my okay. leg. Um, I went to school for uh, kinesiology and physiology, mm-hmm. so I got lucky that I kind of heard that and I knew, and immediately I started to just forcibly like correct myself, like, mm-hmm. okay, just turn your leg a little bit and pick it up a little bit higher. Yeah. And it, it it was a process. It took me a little while to get it, but I was lucky to get there eventually. So that was kind of that to fix that. That was just within yourself to kind of be more aware and just. Yeah. Train and I think it muscle. helped that I was so active prior right. to surgery. And my, I mean, I was I was in great shape. Like it was something that was much made it much easier to recover. Yeah. And your body's amazing. Like the fact that I was able to recover the way that I did, being told the things that I was, is incredible. Well, I was gonna say too. I feel like three days really isn't that long. Like Mm-mm. after that kind of surgery, like I was thinking you're gonna be like, I was in there for like a couple weeks before. Like no. three days is pretty soon to like be trying to get out of bed. You know what yes. I mean? Especially after something that intense. Yes. And they wanted me to do it just to like start that recovery process. Yeah. It was more or less like rebuild your muscular function, rebuild mm-hmm. everything, start that recovery as soon as you can because it's going to be a long path. Right. And I do think it was only three days in the neuro- or in the ICU, and then they transferred me upstairs, and that is where I was finally, you know, able to get up on my own. I walked around this whole time. I didn't shower. I was getting sponge baths. Mm-hmm. That was probably the worst thing for me. Yeah. I was like, just I'm dirty. Mm-hmm. I feel gross. Not washing my hair. I can go a couple of days without washing my hair, but like. A month was right. gross. Could you turn your neck Mm-mm. so it was just straight? Yes. So from all of that inflammation, I was in so much pain. And my dad actually told me from how my face was smushed, I sounded like Fran Drescher. I don't know if you know who that is. Mm-mm. From The Nanny. She has this very okay, nasally yeah. voice. Mm-hmm. And he made fun of me. I, that lasted for a long time. <laughs> so that's just from your face being sm- okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. I just I it was awful, and my throat obviously was impacted. So like me trying to talk was yeah. horrible. But then I couldn't turn my neck. One because of the pain, but two because of how low they put my staples. Mm-hmm. There were two in the bottom that like pulled every time yeah, I turned. I can and I was like, That's, this is yeah. so uncomfortable. I didn't like it, so I just stayed steady. Mm-hmm. I was just I'm not going to turn. I actually ended up like turning my body like this. Yeah, I'll never that's what I was it. like envisioning yes. what it had to be like. <laughs> and I, oh, I really wanted a, a, like a C-spine, like one of those collars because I that just wanted help. support. Yeah. I just wanted support so bad. I was right. in just so much pain. But you know, they didn't do that for me until I got my ride home. And the most miserable part of this whole experience for me was actually waiting to be discharged because I – you need to go to the bathroom – after you have taken all these meds and you need to go to the bathroom before they'll let you leave and I know you have stomach issues Mm -hmm. I have horrible stomach issues I couldn't go well also I went weeks I was going to say but with after surgeries usually that'll constipate you yes right because of the anesthesia I think yeah and the pain meds right Mm -hmm. so all of that stuff backs you up yeah I know that when I got my boobs done I don't think I shit for like a week or so, which yeah. is very unlike me. But I know it's because of the surgery and the medicine. Yes. But 
um, I think not going can make you like nauseous too and, th- and like feel oh, like yeah. crap. I felt like, like, I felt like shit. Yeah, I like even if you're vomiting, it's like yes. not the same. Like right. it's too complete. You need to get things ends. out. Yeah. Yes. So, so you didn't go to the bathroom for like two weeks. Mm-hmm. Which is actually, I mean, okay, this is weird. Kind of normal for me. Okay. I don't go to the bathroom. So you're I'm probably shit like every 11, 11 days or something. Yeah. I have all sort of colitis. So if I wow. like go to the bathroom, this is really gross. But like you're I'll just, fine. I bleed. It's just bleeding if yeah. I go to the bathroom because I have ulcers. Yeah. So that I would rather actually not go to the bathroom. Right. But See, this, I think I have like IBS. So I'm like the yeah. opposite. I'm going all the time. Yeah. No. Wow. Not me. Okay. So yeah. you couldn't go to the bathroom and they won't release you unless so you. So I bless my mom because I only try like it got to a point where I was like asking her to like I've asked her to do an IV for me uh-huh. because I just like sometimes nurses don't know what they're doing and I trust my mom wholeheartedly Mm -hmm. um which is interesting actually I remember looking at my arms to the IV thing they changed my IV so many times during surgery I looked like an addict I had like all of these track marks up and down my arms on my hands like all over it was awful and I mean that added to my pain of like all these needle pricks um, yeah, it's like so many little traumatic things yes. that just overall they compile. Yeah, it they does compile. for sure. Yes, because I know even with the like how you said your face was smushed, and I know too when they put tubes down your throat, mm-hmm. like all of that stuff. That's not even part of really like what you're getting done, right? But it, it really has some painful effects oh, afterwards yeah. for yeah. sure. And my mom was, I mean, she asked about all of that actually. In her like pre-op questions with my mm-hmm. doctor, she uh, asked about like intubating versus – and then can we extubate her? Is she going to be intubated after surgery, which means just all the tubes, basically life support following surgery once I'm in recovery, which was nice. I didn't have to do that. I was just yeah. on oxygen and lots of drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she was worried about me needing like a stent or a shunt, I think, and those are things to like – keep your ventricles open and then I think there's like a stimulator or something in your brain Mm -hmm. but luckily I didn't have to have any of those either which was really great um but so following the needing to leave the hospital uh my mom had to give me like a hot water bag enemas I had to take so many laxatives I was gonna ask if they like started giving you stuff like oh yeah everything Mm -hmm. and I, this is also very gross, but my first shit was white. It was like white, white from all of the drugs that I had taken because I didn't go to the bathroom. So it was just the most disgusting color <laughs> because I, it had been sitting in me yeah. just like soaking up all these meds. And I really couldn't eat very well because uh-huh. of my whole swallowing suction right. issue. So that was very traumatic. And then I wanted to shower before I left. So... My mom had one of her nurse friends from her hospital come and they gave me a shower, which was great. I was only allowed to use dial antibacterial soap on my body and my hair for a, like a couple of weeks after surgery because I still had all of the staples yeah. and just keeping everything clean. Um, and obviously you're very clean. I just felt really gross. Right. I didn't yeah. feel like me. I I was very upset. Um, I wanted to leave the hospital so bad. And I will never forget when they discharged me, we had to go to the like the hospital pharmacy, which was weird. They had a pharmacy in the hospital Mm -hmm. and they prescribed me so many medications. My mom had like this massive bag, like a gallon Ziploc bag just full of meds. And um, she again, thank God she's a nurse because she had like these full lists of how how we're going to take your meds and when we're going to take them and this, that and the other. And I've always had an issue with pain meds like not that I'm addicted, more or less I don't want to take them. Mm -hmm. So it got to a point where I think I was three days in or like a week into being home and I was begging to not be on them because I just, there were so many issues already. I did not want to be just like there. You know what I mean? Like I didn't want to just be there. Right. Because all I think too, when you're taking all that stuff, it's like you don't even feel like yourself. No, I had, I Mm -hmm. was so lost. Yeah. Um, So when we were able to leave, my mom did not leave. She left one time during this whole experience and it was just to go home and take a shower. Mm -hmm. And then my dad stayed with me that period of time. And I'll never forget this. In that time frame, my dad actually sat on my hospital bed with me and I could not take the cool cloth off of my eyes. I had a cool cloth. I had 
this blanket on and I just laid there like as in a little cocoon and I never moved. Mm -hmm. And he came inside of my bed. He knew how bad I wanted to drop out of school. I absolutely hated school. I did not want to be in college. I felt like it was pointless. I didn't want to do it. And I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I was just there. And I got, I was so freaked out that I wasn't going to be able to go back. And I think that started to just kind of trickle something in my brain. And he sat down and he said, you know, bud, you don't have to go back to school. It's okay. And that was like a constant battle between him and I, is mm-hmm. me going back to school. And I said, no, no, I, I'll think about it. And then he told me that he had paid off my student loans. Oh, and I was like, sweet. dad, you are the most amazing man in the entire world. It's mm-hmm. like this whole situation really sucked. And it was horrible that it happened, but it bonded my family and I so much right. more. And it was something that I'm actually really grateful for that we were able to come together like that. Yeah. Um, but so for my ride home, I had, they did actually give me a collar, which was wonderful. And I remember we being wheeled out of the hospital and everybody was staring at me. I felt like I didn't have one eyeball not looking at me. It was very, I felt like a zoo, a, an animal in a zoo. It was awful. Mm-hmm. And then the ride home was miserable. Um, yeah. just the moving, the mm-hmm. bumping, the bouncing, the turning, I couldn't move my head. So I'm like trying to look at everybody and I'm panicking and yeah. I like, I have panic attacks now, which I never had before, which kind of sucks. But when we got home, I immediately just went to bed. My little downstairs, basically apartment became my home. Um, I slept. My mom slept with me for a really long period of time because I needed help going to the bathroom. I needed help walking. I couldn't shower myself. I couldn't really do anything alone. So she stayed with me for a really long time, which was great. But that's when the whole recovery process for me really started. I think you can will yourself to die. I think you can will yourself to be better. Mm -hmm. If you're in a spot in your life where you are so sick and you just don't see yourself getting any better, you can absolutely will yourself to die. Mm -hmm. And I just got to a point where I was like, not happening. I'm not going to die. I refuse to let that be the outcome. I've been this strong for everybody for so long. That's the last thing they need. So I kind of made it a point that I was going to go back to school, that I was going to graduate, that I was going to start working as soon as I could, that I was going to walk like a normal person. I was going to start going back to the gym. I was going to do everything I could. Um, It wasn't as quick as I wanted. My neurosurgeons wanted me to be on my pain meds for, I don't know, I think it was at least a month. They wanted me on all these drugs. They were like, you trust me, you want to be on them. It's not going to be fun to stop taking them. Um, So I took what they said and I rolled with it, but at my pace. Um, This is where I started to get emotional. So like I said before, I did not cry or feel any like bad vibes during the beginning and during the surgery portion. It was after. Well, also, I think recovery time can be very, very frustrating, especially when it's drawn out that long. Yes. And it's like you're relying on people and then if Mm -hmm. somebody's not doing something like fast enough or right you're like Mm -hmm. you get mad and it's really it's not their fault but it's just like you're just so frustrated yes like all you want to do is be better Mm -hmm. and all you want to do I felt like such a nuisance I just felt like just everybody had to wait on me hand and foot Mm -hmm. everybody's lives kind of stopped around me and I felt just horrible about that and like I I had really bad insomnia my dad had to get up with me in the middle of the night I would get up at 2 a.m and I would just be like ready to start my day I'm ready to go. And he would watch like ridiculousness with me or something on TV until I was ready to go back to sleep. Like it was just everything was about Molly. And I really hated that. I absolutely hated that. Um, But I just wanted to talk normal again. I wanted to be able to turn my head. I wanted to be able to swallow everything. I wanted to just resume my normal life. And so that was really frustrating. And I was in so much pain and nothing was going the way I wanted. That's when I started breaking down and just I freaked everybody out to where I was saying, like, I just wish it would have taken me. I, this is nobody should live like this. I wish it would have taken me. And I think having said that freaked my parents out enough to be like, OK, we're just going to we're going to push her. We're going to try and see like where we can go from here. I remember my first post-op appointment. Um, so I had to go back to the hospital and they just went over my scans with me, said everything looked great. And this is where they kind of gave us the breakdown of what the tumor was why it was there, how it got there, everything. And it scared the living shit out of me. So the tumor, like I said, I was born with. 
And it was all of these little baby cells that just kind of grew slowly in my brain. Usually they find the tumor I had specifically between the ages of six and eight years old. And once we started hearing all of the things that go hand in hand with this tumor, so I had what's called a juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma, which we just call it a JPA, but it's just, it's a juvenile tumor. It's something you find in kids and it's relatively manageable when you find it when you're young. Um, I was basically an anomaly. People don't keep this tumor for as long as I did. It's very rare. It's something that they don't see very often. I think my surgeon said he'd seen something similar to it twice in his career, and he was old, Mm -hmm. like most steady hands in the entire world, but he was old. And so knowing that was kind of a little freaky too, like how how the hell did this happen? Um, With my cerebellum being squished again, how is she playing all these sports? What is, how is she doing any of this? It just doesn't make sense. And that's kind of where the whole medical miracle, medical anomaly came up. And that I knew at that point, like I've made it this far with the tumor. How much further can I go without it? Right. Um, so during, again, that post-op first appointment, my doctor told me the ventricles that line the top of your brain were so squished we give you we were going to give you 3 months max until you were dead those ventricles were going to burst in yeah. your brain and you were just going to die instantly and hearing that freaked me out and i think they knew that prior to my surgery but they obviously held off on right, that information like imagine if you weren't getting those well, like so things imagine like if they sent me home from the er well that right? without getting my scan exactly That's, like i that. tell everybody and, advocate for yourself yeah and even the fact that like if you didn't happen to get that thing where when you were turning your neck, you were actually getting sick. Mm-hmm. Like if you were, if you just kept going on with migraines, there's a chance that you would have gone on another few months. With oh, yeah. Just like, oh, I just had bad migraines. Until you know I, I mean? just was right. done. Yeah. There are so many things that came up. Um, but when we found out what the tumor was, everything started to click. Mm-hmm. When I was – Gosh, I told you, I was between six and eight. I want to say I was six or seven. Mm -hmm. I had what is called early onset puberty. So I started getting like hair everywhere. And my mom was like, this is my baby. She shouldn't be going through puberty this early. She took me to an endocrinologist. And having early onset puberty is one of the number one indicators of the kind of tumor I had. Wow. And this endocrinologist didn't even think like, oh, we should just let's give her a CT scan, see what's going on. He just said, she's got early onset puberty. She'll be fine. Send her home. No big deal. Which doesn't make any sense because I ended up going through my first cycle when I was like 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. So like that huge age discrepancy is very odd. Um, But then it was the sleeping uh, for 36 hours. Like I said, I could do it. No problem. The migraines I was suffering. The just the mood swings. I had the worst mood swings. And this was all prior to finding out anything. Like high school me was probably a nightmare I'm, I I would assume I had like the resting bitch face the fuck you written across my forehead that I that sounds like me yeah oh and I, like, <laughs> I did not like I one I didn't give a shit I was yeah. like none of these people I'm ever gonna see again I walked around high school with headphones in I just did not care I did not want to be around them and then I would go home and I would just get pissy like I would just scream for no reason I would get angry I'd tell people to leave me the fuck alone all I wanted to do was be in my bedroom my parents called me a vampire because I just needed all of the lights off I needed it to be dark and I wanted to be alone and I did fine in school like Mm -hmm. I was doing great I had 163 unexcused absences my senior year (laughs) because I would go home and take naps yeah I needed to sleep. So you were tired all the time too? All the time. Okay. All the time. And playing competitive tennis at this point, that was my sport. Um, I took privates all the time. I was playing year round. I was training. I had to do, I had to lift weights. I had to take all the courses. And then I obviously had practices and matches. Like I was constantly active. And I think that I mean, hindsight is because of the tumor, but it was just the overly stress, like overly stressing my body, working too hard and then going to school. And I was passing all my classes. I graduated with a 3.8. I did just fine. But that all just culminated into just you're going to be tired all the time, which was just miserable. But again, finding out now why I was the way that I was is a little bit comforting because I wasn't just a psychopath who had hormone issues. Yeah. I I had a brain tumor. Yeah, yeah, I had a brain tumor, which, you know, it, 
not a great thing, but yeah. the excuse is the excuse. My parents actually call it that, my whole family. Mm-hmm. Oh, don't drop the brain tumor card, Molly. I'm like, right. well, I have no filter. I'm going to mm-hmm. drop the brain tumor card. Right. Uh, so that kind of was very interesting to find out, like all of the things that led up to the tumor that, again, the revolving door in that hospital setting is – She's fine. Chalk it up. No problem. Send her home. Right. It's like you have to push. You have to push. And so, I mean, gosh, I told my mom she could easily go sue this doctor for totally sending me home knowing that I had a brain tumor and doing nothing about it. But um, just everything that compiled was really interesting. And when we noticed all of those things, it was very un- like telling. We mm-hmm. all kind of had this light bulb like, oh, it makes so much sense now. Right. Um, I was able to go back to school actually after after the summer. I pushed myself really hard. So I had surgery in May, very end of May. I went back for school in August. Wow. I did one class. I had to really take it easy. My doctors did tell me like, you got to treat your body like you're 60. So were you going into school? Mm -hmm. Okay. I went into school and – I was riding the light rail because I lived at home. So I was able to take a train to school because mm-hmm. I was just going to school in the city. And my mom was like, nope, you're going to start driving yourself. I remember when I drove for the first time, I was absolutely terrified. Could you turn your neck at this point? Yes. Okay. So I ended up um, after a few, like this was uh, probably three months, I want to okay. say, or two months that – was a lot of just recovery at home, going to the doctor. I remember getting my staples out. I totally passed out. My blood pressure dropped tremendously. Was that Um, painful, getting them out? Oh, my gosh. Very. And you'd think it wouldn't be because, like, I now have no feeling on my scalp at all in the back. Like, I've burnt my – You don't really – No. My bone can feel it, which is weird. Like, I can feel it inside. Okay. I don't know. But not the skin. My skin. I've burnt my head a couple of times trying to use, like, heating tools. Wait. So, did they say – So, was it cancerous or was it No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, No, you're fine. So, it was benign. It is not hereditary. It obviously should not grow back now, but Mm -hmm. just something that I was born with and something that – just needed to be taken out of my brain but I just needed to go regardless it needed to go and And it was growing right like it yes when you were born it wasn't that size right yes it grew obviously really slowly and I think where it was made it grow a lot slower because there is no space in the middle of your brain I mean and if you I'll show you my MRI after this it's crazy to see how massive this whole situation was in the middle but now I do have like a small little hole in my brain where cerebral spinal fluid kind of just floats around Mm -hmm. so I do sometimes have issues still with like dizziness and I can't drink the way I used to I can't I mean I still get really bad migraines the pressure changes with weather so the barometric pressure when it gets really cold outside or when we're getting a snowstorm in Colorado it's miserable I get wicked migraines they last for like three days wow I obviously get a ton of pain in this area Um, I get phantom pains but I also get pain where that plate is because the plate gets cold it's not like something I can keep warm okay so it gets really really cold in the winter specifically which is miserable Mm -hmm. but I still deal with a lot of things following surgery yeah I know I'm kind of like bouncing all over the place now (laughs) so how long ago was the surgery now Five years this past May. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So I – I mean, it took me a while. I did end up going back to school for Mm -hmm. that one class. And then I was able to finish out my semester in 2019. I graduated. So it took me a year longer than normal, but I was okay with it because I – that was like a goal of mine. I'm going to go graduate specifically for my dad. Mm -hmm. But I went and graduated, which was really cool. And that was a very fulfilling moment. Um, I went back to work pretty much as quickly as I could as soon as I started school. And my doctors were a little pissed at me. They were like, you're pushing yourself way too hard. You are going way too hard. You are exhausting yourself. You're stressing yourself out. You're going to make this recovery take a lot longer. Yeah. I needed to slow down. And I just like can't. Right. I couldn't slow down because then I felt like I wasn't progressing. Um. So I just – I still kept doing it. I started – I mean, I take medications just ever so often now if I have migraines. Mm-hmm. Um. But I did have, a, again, a lot of repercussions. I – found out that I had um, a lot of hormonal issues because of where my hypothalamus was impacted. 
I had to start kind of taking different medications for like bipolar disorder and anxiety and depression. Like I was start, I started to deal with things that I've never had before in my life. I've never dealt with. And that, that was all from how the tumor was. Where the tumor in. was. Okay. Mm-hmm. And having it taken out, now everything was able to kind of expand mm-hmm. back into as much as it could back into its normal spot. So I was starting to get all of these functions back that I really hadn't had for a while. So I was experiencing a lot of things that I had never experienced before. And like claustrophobia, I get really claustrophobic now. And I used to never be claustrophobic ever. I never had a problem with being in small spaces. Um, Anxiety, I get panic attacks all the time. So, and you think that's from just like PTSD from Mm -hmm. everything? Yeah. And I think too, it's just like, I sometimes have hormonal overload. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I just, I overthink everything and then I stress myself out and then my system goes off. Right. You're done. You're Mm -hmm. done. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be moody. You need to just shut down for a while. Mm -hmm. And I still, obviously I still deal with that and that's something I'll have to deal with the rest of my life. Um, But no, I can't drink. I had no filter prior to any of this. When I drink, I say whatever the fuck I want. And I am (laughs) so unapologetic and I could give two shits who I hurt, what I say. I just speak my mind, speak my truth. And it can be really bad. I actually messed up Thanksgiving last year really bad (laughs) to where I got sent home. (laughs) Yeah. I really I don't necessarily know exactly what I did Mm -hmm. um I know I was really inappropriate probably a little too sexual so (laughs) was told (laughs) so were you is it that you were like that was just from like drinking in general or like you think it has to do it has to do with my tumor because I I before I had surgery I would drink and I did a bunch of stuff and I partied I mean I went to raves in high school Uh I I did illicit drugs I've done this stuff um and so it's like more recent that now it's like when you yeah. drink, it's... Oh, yeah. After surgery. Okay. I didn't drink for a while. Um, That's I so interesting. I haven't touched anything. I don't smoke weed. I don't do any of that. And I haven't touched any of that stuff since mm-hmm. I at least, gosh, for a while before surgery. But since I had surgery, I, I'm terrified to do anything. Yeah. I don't even like taking like a Tylenol. I just hate it. I don't like I know. putting I stuff like in my body. I feel like it's one of those things too where it's like, yeah, it's great that the tumor is out, but now... Because it was in there your whole life. It's like, okay, how is my body going to react to A, B, and C? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's different. You're, exactly. You know? I'm totally relearning the whole thing. Um, yeah. I lost a lot of weight after surgery. And I remember a lot of people being like, is that because of your tumor? Like, what's going on? And I think... I was terrified to put anything in my body. I thought I was going to start having allergic reactions. I didn't know if I had to just completely start my system over. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of, I tried step by step to reintroduce everything into my body. And it was a process, but never going to do a drug again. That's for sure. And I don't drink as much as I used to. Ever since Um, Thanksgiving. It's a no Ever since Thanksgiving. (laughs) I can never drink again. No, I don't drink a ton. Just out of respect for the people who are around me, unless I'm just at home with yeah. with my mans, then, you know, maybe we'll have a couple of right. drinks, but I can probably say too many things to him too, which I should Right. <laughs> you can't be trusted. And I, no, I can't, I, I can't control it. I, 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 I really can relate. <laughs> maybe not to the fullest extent, but I can relate. I can't control it. And yeah. it's, I mean, it could be detrimental. I mm-hmm. definitely, oh, yeah. it took me a while to be able to see that side of my family again after Thanksgiving, for sure. I mean, yes, I definitely have no filter. I'll say whatever the fuck I want. Mm -hmm. I will do whatever the fuck I want. I could care less what people think about me. Yeah. Um, This was a different setting. Maybe not the best. This is a little too far. (laughs) Maybe not the best family Uh to be around either. Like, I have two different sides of family. So, like, my dad's side, my mom's side. My mom's side, I am much more comfortable with. I'm much more open with. They know me so much better. They know that, like, oh, that's just Molly. Molly does whatever the fuck she wants to do. This was a little bit different because we're yeah. not as close with my dad's mm-hmm. side of the family. And I wish I had something to say other than like, I don't know right. what to do. I Oh, my God. Definitely embarrassing well, look, to see them a couple of times after. It's a going. story that you have now. Oh, yeah. So, and you can just blame the tumor. Right? And that's what I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's the best crutch. My yeah. dad named him Jimmy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, there you go. Yeah. So Jimmy is the best, best crutch for everything yeah. though. Like... 
well, you didn't get your homework done on time. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I had a brain tumor. It's yeah. just, it takes Jimmy me a little bit longer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's not there anymore. Right. I, I did so well with him. So mm-hmm. I'm just trying to recalibrate That's my face. That's crazy though that like <laughs> certain things like that, whether it's like alcohol or even like you said, like maybe weed or something, mm-hmm. it could just totally have a different reaction. I am so scared to touch that stuff yeah. ever that again. That is crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's been since I want to say my freshman year first semester of college Uh that I have literally touched anything except for alcohol so I'm sure I would have some sort of panic attack Mm -hmm. at the most at the least amount yeah but I mean spins I don't ever want to have the spins again no right that was miserable Mm -hmm. but I mean now I am so lucky I've gotten to a point where I graduated college I work a normal job I'm in a stable relationship I live by myself. I don't have to rely on my parents as, parents as much as I used to, which is nice. And I've kind of had that huge weight lifted off my shoulders with this past May being that five years yeah. brain tumor free because those five years leading up to that, I still had it in the back of my mind. Like, what if it comes right. back? What am I going to do? Am I going to have surgery again? And am I just going to have radiation? Like, what are they going to suggest? Am I going to just have to f- live with it and take meds and hope it doesn't kill me? Like, I didn't know. Yeah. And so when I got the like that final five years and they told me you don't have to come back for two years now for my MRI, I used to go, I went twice a year for the first two years Mm -hmm. and then once a year for the last three. Okay. And now I can go every two years, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, But I mean, every time I went to the neuro with an image, I just had to hold my breath. Yeah. And my doctors just kept harping, you know, you're going to be exhausted you're going to have stress, you're going to get migraines, and it's all manageable with rest and don't push yourself. Mm -hmm. I have to treat myself like a 60-year-old, which is so shitty being I'm going to be 27 in February. Having to deal with that just sucks because I want to do all of these things. I would love to go out and celebrate with people or go have a drink or go do something fun. Even my job, I exhaust myself so much that I just get so run down my weekends I try and relax and my boyfriend he is an adventurer he likes to go out and do stuff so I try and push myself to do that but then it just turns into like I need to sleep for 12 hours I get 10 hours of sleep every night I go to bed at like eight and I wake up at six sometimes well I try to go to bed at eight because I'm always up at six because of the cats but um, I feel like it's really good to to sleep that much and get yeah. that because honestly, even for me, when I go to bed past like ten or eleven, mm-hmm. grannies, right? Yeah. Um, it's <laughs> like it really sleep is important for anybody. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? So especially with something like what you've went through and that kind of traumatic thing in, inside your brain, it's like you, it's so crucial. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think too, I feel like I feel like I. I can see why like you'd want to push yourself to do those things. But at the same time, it's like your health yes. comes first. And yes. I feel like, I mean, what are you, I don't want to say what are you really missing out on, but like when it comes to going out and like getting those drinks. Oh, and stuff I'm over like that. that. You know what I mean? I'm right. so it's over like, that. It's one of those things that there's going to, I feel like you're going to have those moments every now and then where mm-hmm. it's like, okay, I got enough sleep. Like I can go and I can enjoy that. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like treating yourself to the best of your ability and like giving yourself that time and that right. recovery and the rest, even though it's been that, that five years, mm-hmm. it's like it's still so crucial and important and for yes. all of us, even those who haven't ha- gone through something right. like that. Yeah. Um. But you know, I, I think that, I think it's cool though that your boyfriend is like, you know, the adventure because I yes. feel like it, it does to some degree, like if you have that enough energy, it'll push you to like, okay, like I'll go. You know what I mean? Because I always go with him. I definitely take advantage of that. The memories. I was going to say too, at the same time, I feel like kind of going back to what you said about, um, you can either have the will to like live or die. Mm -hmm. It's like you could, if you, maybe if, if you didn't have like a really good support group, you could fall into this trap of like almost babying yourself too much where like you never want to go out of the house and it's like you sleep too much. So I I feel like it does sound like you have a really good balance. I found a happy medium. Yeah. Yeah. And And I I like to go a little bit more than I should. Yeah. Because you're you're young. I'm young. I don't want to stop my life and truly be a 60-year-old woman. Right. I'm not ready for that. No. (laughs) I'm not ready for that. And I'm sure you'll go through phases too of like you'll have like a week or a month where you're like, I want to be 60. And then you'll have a week where like, I want to be 27. Yeah. But – um. I was going to say something now. I can't remember. But no, I, I think that – I think too, 
certain things suck in the sense of like, okay, maybe you can't really like drink anymore because mm-hmm. you get a little a little nuts. But <laughs> I'm but okay you, with it. Right. And there's things too. <laughs> At it's this like point. I feel like anything in life, you know, things are gonna change. You know, mm-hmm. you're gonna go through changes sometimes, you know, when when we're younger we could drink and party and now when you, even when you get older and you start getting hangovers and then you can't drink as much. It's like there's always gonna be little things that you kind of have to adjust. Mm-hmm. But I think that the fact that you f- survived something so traumatic mm-hmm. and like literally beat past like all of these odds. Like you said, like they usually find these tumors in kids. Yeah. And the fact that you made it all the way to what, 21, 21. with it? Yeah. That's crazy. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's just, it's totally nuts. And yes. I think too, I wanted to say, mention earlier, I feel like the whole process that you went through, and I, obviously you know this, but it makes you so much stronger as mm-hmm. a person. You know, I think that it's so important, you know, for people to experience something that makes them have to fight. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not that it should be a brain tumor. No. <laughs> but but just something that gives them, it, like you said, once again, you, you either keep going and you push yourself forward or right. you let it just eat you alive. Yes. And I feel like the fact that you had to go through something that just forced you to just keep pushing mm-hmm. and come out on top of it, it, it just, it gives you this whole new outlook I feel like on life yes. and to appreciate those small things and right. just everything in general because you know I think that it really it can teach you a lot about mm-hmm. yourself and about life as a whole and just even like you were saying too like how you started living for that mo- the moment of things like before your before surgery, surgery yeah, yeah it's like you start to realize like how important those little things are and it's like you know what I'm just gonna live every second like mm-hmm. this could be it you know yeah. and I, I feel like it, that's really important to know because I think it's so easy to get wrapped up in just life and yes sometimes being so, like so stressed and miserable and it's like we really don't know in regards to um like getting my story out there is one I would love to just help anybody who's going through something similar right. or watching somebody go through it I think it's important to hear that you know there are people who can come out on the positive side I did try and go to some like group brain tumor support groups. And I felt so guilty going to those because everybody was kind of just way worse off than I was. And it was a lot harder of a process for them. And it should have been really hard for me. Again, I don't know why I did as well as I did. They kept calling me a medical miracle, like this anomaly. It just is so rare. It doesn't happen. Well, and I think too, you know, there's always going to be people in the world that when they go through something, they don't have as good as as good of a support group and they Mm -hmm. don't have like it's not an easy process right not that yours was but you like you said you you were lucky you had your family and that you got so lucky in the ways that you even made it as long as you did yes um but i think that that's like it just makes it a miracle it makes it even more something to be even more grateful for absolutely um but i can see how you said like you like if you like did you just not feel like you fit in there because it wasn't yeah i just it yeah and i was recovering and i think some of them actually did have cancerous brain tumors which was a lot harder and they're not very likely to survive those kinds of tumors. Um, And I think just being as strong as I was and totally fine, I think I might have waited a little too long to go to those support groups. And so I only went to like two of them and I stopped. Mm -hmm. But if I had gone immediately after surgery, I would have felt a little bit more comfortable because I was still kind of obviously recovering. recovering. Um, but no, I just, I couldn't do that because I just felt guilty. Like I was totally fine and all of these people are still suffering. Um, I think now though I've come around to being okay sharing my story and I just want people to know that, you know, you have people around you regardless of if it's your family or your friends, you have support you can find the most absolute amazing team. Your body is incredible. Your recovery is the way that you recover from things is just profound. It's it's rare to even like think about in that way that it's you can be just fine and then you can will yourself to live and be grateful for all of your experiences, but that number one thing was definitely advocate for yourself because they don't it's a revolving door yeah they don't want you there they and there's just want so you many and they people, want you right out. they have so many people coming in with that think they're dying yes technically mm-hmm. you know and and i think too you know right and i feel like unless you're specifically calling 
like a specialist, yes. then you're probably not going to have people wanting to run every single test. Right. So yeah, I mean, I, I 100% agree that if you really feel like something's wrong, trust your body. Yes. You know, and what it's telling you. And yeah. My mom tells me now, she's like, I will never discount mm-hmm. anything you say to me. Right. I will never, never, yeah. never tell you you're wrong. Because- and it's true. And right. And, and nothing, you know, no knock to your mom either. But even when it comes to like, you know, maybe family or friends, like mm-hmm. if you genuinely in your inside of your body feel like, okay, something's not right. Like you said, how you eventually were like went to your dad and you were like, yeah. something's, something's wrong. wrong. Yeah. Right. It's like no matter who it is, if you don't feel right, you should always just push to figure it. Because the best case scenario is it's nothing. Right. You know, but you might, it's but better But you get to, answers. Yes, It's exactly. some clarity. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I think you know, what's really weird now when I talk to people about it is I tell them how grateful I am for the experience. Mm-hmm. I would not do anything differently again. Um, if I had the brain tumor and I had figured it out the same way, I would have gone about it the exact same way. I would have tried to live my life to the fullest and gone through the surgery. I probably wouldn't have been so aggressive in pushing myself to recover and I probably would have tried to maintain more composure because I did let my emotions get the best of me sometimes Mm -hmm. but I am so beyond grateful because I've met a lot of really incredible people I've been able to communicate my story and just touch as many people as I can and I know how short life really is and I will never take it for granted and I've done a lot of things that I think I probably shouldn't have done and I think a lot of us have been there. Um, But now I just, it's like a keep moving forward thing and do what you love. Like I told you, I'm a nanny. I take care of kids for a living and I manage a household and I absolutely love it. It is my dream. It's my passion and it's so unconventional and people I'm sure judge me when they hear that that's what I do as a 27 year old, but I love it. Well, I was going to say too, like it's funny because when you were saying how growing up that's like always wanted you what you wanted to be was a mom mm-hmm. like it makes sense to me like yes and, and it really does prove to me that you're doing that because that's what you love and that's yeah. what you want and to be and it's what I want to do yeah yeah and it's I mean it's not like it's not a lucrative business no, I, definitely not. I and I love it I love what I do and I just have been so blessed to find the most amazing family that I work for I just love their kids I love these yeah. people they're amazing um but everybody has kind of just kept me moving forward and been the most amazing support. And now I'm finally able to kind of do it on my own, which I really appreciate. And I'm finally, you know, starting my life. I'm finally getting to a point where I feel comfortable doing everything that I've ever wanted to do. Um, I actually made a live list when I was in the hospital. And this was before I had surgery. And it was kind of like, as soon as I find out that I'm okay, I'm doing all these things. I started, I mean, I got a couple of tattoos, which I love. And I'm the only person in my family who has tattoos. And that's a total taboo thing. But I was like, I'm getting tattoos. I bleached my hair blonde. I was blonde for a hot minute. I graduated school. I did everything I wanted to do. Um, But now it's just coming down to like being a wife and a mom. Those are my last two things, which I'm sure I could probably make this massively long list, but I didn't want it to be like some ridiculous thing. Like I would never jump out of an airplane. Right. So that would never be on my list anyway. But I just wanted it to be things that I could definitely reach. Mm -hmm. But now I just have those two left, which I'm excited about because I see that in my future. And that's what's important to you, which is all that matters. Yes. Yeah. I'm really, really lucky. And I'm really grateful it happened. Yeah. That's amazing. And I think too, like you said, I feel like everybody – in general, like whether you're going through something serious or not, everyone should have those lists and those mm-hmm. little things that they want to do and just yeah. and do them when they have the time because Absolutely. you never know, you know, right. like anything could happen. We all, this could all be all of our last day. We never know. Exactly. So it's really important to just do the things that you love, like you said, and make you happy. And, and tell everybody you love them. Yes. Don't ever not, you know, express your emotions, especially towards your family and your friends. Mm-hmm. Always tell your people you love them. Yeah. And your list doesn't have to be aggressive. Like no. mine was see a Paramore concert, go mm-hmm. to Disney World. Like it was just the most minimal things. Right. But just massive goals that you feel like you've attained. And I mean, I like that. I'm kind of a smaller goal kind of person. So reach your small goals and then work towards that super big goal, but like in tiny little steps, which is totally fine. For sure. Well, I think that's amazing. Thank you. And your story is amazing. You're amazing. And thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. I I really do think too, like I said, um, I know I always say this in different ways on the show, but I really do think that your story is so important because there's probably a lot of people that don't always feel great like physically Mm -hmm. and they just kind of accept it. And I feel like it's important to hear that like you shouldn't. And like I said, even if you, even if the answer is that it's nothing, I think it's important to hear that like, it's not like you knew right away what was going on. It took some, 
time and work to figure out like, yes. oh, this is what's wrong with me. And now I have to get an immediate surgery. Yeah. So it was my I, whole life. I yeah. mean, it was, it was crazy. But exactly. just, yeah, advocate for yourself. Push for, push for what you need. For awesome. Sure. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. This is fun. <laughs>